Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Key Gripe, the show for short, sweet reviews of new release movies, plus the one thing that annoyed me the most. And today, I'm going to be talking about Pixar's Finding Dory. This is obviously a sequel to Finding Nemo, and um, really, it's obviously been a big enough gap in between the two that it seems only fitting that they would try to go back to that well, since Finding Nemo is what some might consider to be the best Pixar movie. I wouldn't consider that, but there's a lot of people who do consider it to be kind of the icon of Pixar. When you think of the best Pixar movies, you're certainly going to get Toy Story, you're going to get Finding Nemo, you're going to get The Incredibles, um, Wally. I mean, you're going to get a number of these movies that they've made over the years that are just fantastic. And Finding Nemo, of course, is always in that upper echelon of movies when we talk about creativity, originality, just the beauty of the animation, the story itself, so much about it. Um, but here we have a sequel, um, Finding Dory. It um, takes place basically, I'll say, shortly after the end of the first one. Um, you know, there's there's a point in the beginning of the movie where you where the two stories, inter where the you know the beginning of Dory's story intersects with the beginning of Marlin's story, and that's where we get their interaction at the beginning of Finding Nemo. That's that collision occurs early in this movie to kind of give you some context, and then it takes us forward a year later. But how the movie begins is Dory as a child was you know, obviously had this, you know, short-term memory loss issue that she's always had um, as a child, and her parents were working with her to, you know, kind of, you know, be careful, you know, to, to be careful in the world and, you know, to, to follow certain rules so that, you know, she would be safe, basically, you know, is what the parents would do. Um, and unfortunately, something happened and she got lost. She got separated from her parents and because she had this short-term memory loss, she didn't, she wasn't able to find, you know, like easily get her way, you know, find her way back because she didn't know where she lived. You know, she just knew she was looking for her parents and then over time she even forgot that that's what she was doing. She completely lost the memory of what she was, her goal was in the, in the first place. Um, and then obviously she interacts with Marlin, we get the Finding Nemo story, which is, you know, this great epic adventure, and the story then returns to, you know, the present time, you know, at the end of Finding Nemo, basically, um, where, you know, they're living together on the reef, you know, they're friends, they're doing stuff, and at this point, then Dory remembers, oh, I, I've been looking, I, you know, I, I'm trying to remember, you know, my family, you know, and... So she wants to set out on this adventure to find her family, but there, she obviously doesn't have a lot of the details of her family because it's these memories are just broken. She doesn't have a full picture of you know where she came from as a child. So they you know she but she does have one big piece and she, okay so it's like okay now we got to go to California and find this place. So you know they travel to California. They use the turtles to get there. It's Dory, Marlin, and Nemo basically go to to do this. And when they get there, they find out that the place that they're looking for is actually a um, marine rescue. It's like a, basically a marine, um, almost like an aquarium, but like kind of a marine rescue lab place that um, um, they basically are pulling, you know, injured fish or sick fish out of the ocean, helping them recover, and then ideally setting them free. But she comes to find out this is where she actually came from. And when they grab her and bring her into the Institute, she meets up with this octopus who's um, basically trying to escape his situation so that he can get on this cushy situation in Cleveland. You know, they're taking a bunch of fish to Cleveland and he wants to go because he doesn't want to be in this, you know, marine life place anymore. So, um, so she makes a deal with him that if he helps her find her family, she will give him the tag that she has that basically will give him, you know, the ticket to Cleveland. You know, it's the goal of every fish, apparently, in the story to go to Cleveland. Um, <laughs> um, and so they, the two of them basically set out all the same time. Marlin and Nemo are trying to find Dory because, obviously, she got picked up. And so they, you know, ask a couple of sea lions, you know, a couple of lazy sea lions for their, you know, their help. And they basically hook them up with this um, bird. I don't know what kind of bird it is. Uh, with this really bizarre bird who, you know, once they, once they connect, then that bird will help them. Um, and it, as they, you know, move forward, you know, move, each 
move forward in the story, Dory starts to get more and more pieces of the puzzle back in her memory. Like she meets a whale shark that she knew as a child, her her uh, pipe pal, as they call him, um, and then a uh, um, I forget which kind of whale it is, but basically one with echolocation uh, named Bailey, who um, doesn't like to use his echolocation because it gives him a headache. <laughs> um, so as she starts to put these pieces together and she gets further down with the help of Hank, the the oct or the septopus, actually, not an octopus, he's a septopus because he lost a tentacle. Um, you know, they, they make their way through the, through the, the uh, marine um, lab and ultimately get to where the, her parents are supposed to be and they're not there and that's when she discovers that they went looking you know she basically finds you know finds a number of other fish like her who reveal to her that her parents went looking for her when she was a kid and never came back and that was years before so the chances of them still being there or being alive even are pretty slim uh, which is obviously a sobering moment for Dory but um, all the while then but they, she does end up finding them um, alive her parents and when she does, then she realizes that her other family, her friends, Marlin and Nemo, that she's, you know, become so attached to, they're actually in danger now because they got stuck on the truck that's going to Cleveland. So if she ever wants to see them again, she needs, they need to do something to get the truck and, you know, stop the truck and get it back, which, of course, they do. And when they do, they all get back in the ocean. They, you know, go back to the reef where... You know, her parents join them, and, you know, it's a big, happy family, and Hank the Septipus has, you know, a change of heart and becomes, you know, a part of the, part of the clan there as well. Um, and that's the story. You know, it's, it's very similar to Finding Nemo plot-wise, obviously. In this case, though, um, and, and I have a couple of problems with this movie, but I'm gonna, I might get into those in a minute. But, um, I mean... Beauty, the movie the movie is obviously very beautiful as you would expect from Pixar. The animation is just glorious. Um, you know the voice acting is pretty good. Um, you know Ellen DeGeneres and Albert Brooks are back to play their respective roles, um, which both of them obviously nailed in the first movie, and here they they bring it right back. Um, Hank the Septipus is played by Ed O'Neill. It was hard for I couldn't tell who he was throughout the entire movie, but and then when I found out it was him, it's like oh yeah okay. Uh, Kaylin Olsen plays the whale shark. Uh, Ty Burrell does the the uh, beluga, the um, um, the echolocation whale. <laughs> who once he like figures out his powers, he becomes like a superhero. It's like I got I, I can see them using his echolocation. It's it's kind of funny. Um, who else is in there? It's got Bill Hader who seems to be in everything. Same with Idris Elba. He's Idris Elba has done a voice in like three different movies this year. <laughs> um, and Bill Hader, same thing, he's always showing up in these movies. Dominic West, uh, Kate McKinnon, uh, just to name a few more. Um, obviously, John Ratzenberger um, shows up in the movie. I don't remember exactly which person, which character he played, but he obviously... It's not a Pixar movie without John Ratzenberger showing up somewhere. Um, and there's actually a kind of a cute scene at the end where the... The sea lions are played by Idris Elba and Dominic West, and <laughs> they're these two, they're, you know, very, like, lazy, they got this rock, you know, they're just, like, chilling out, and there's this other seal who's just this, like, goofy, you know, weird-looking unibrow seal, you know, you know, buck-tooth unibrow seal, that every time he, like, gets onto the rock, they, like, bark him off, and <laughs> they have, like, this, this scene where, you know, they're, you know, they're on the rock, and the, that seal comes back on, and they bark him off, and then... You know, after they're they're kind of done there, then somehow the seal comes right back. It's just like sitting behind them, and it's it's just this goofy, cute little scene. The sea lions in this movie are very funny. Um, and as they're doing that, then the <laughs> I should have a key gripe with this, but it was just funny to see them. Um, in at the end of Finding Nemo, all of the aquarium ant fish that um, were with Nemo in the dentist's office, they all escaped in the bags, right? And at the end of this movie, in the after credit scene, they're all still there. They're all still in the bags. The bags are covered in, like, gr you know, grime and gunk and all that stuff. But they're still puttering around. It's like, hey, we made it, y'all. And then they get picked up out of the ocean <laughs> by the uh, Institute people. Um, by, you know, the voice of Sigourney Weaver. That was <laughs> the other thing. Is this Institute, you know, it's like a aquarium basically so it's a place for families to go and Sigourney Weaver does the voice of Sigourney Weaver who's like welcoming people to this institute so everyone's always talking about Sigourney Weaver told me to do it <laughs> which I thought was kind of cute too um 
before I get into the negative, because I actually did have a couple of problems with this movie, I do want to point out something that was somewhat surprisingly powerful in a way. Um, because you don't see this very often in movies, um, especially with kids' movies, and I thought in this day and age, it's important that they address it, in a sense. Um, so, Dory, we know, has short-term memory loss, which means she struggles with, you know, creating new memories, um, but in order for her to, do, to create new memories, part of what they have to do is create patterns and create, like, sort of situations to kind of help her understand and help her remember and sort of make those things instinct as opposed to memory. And as her, throughout her memories, when she's having these kind of flashbacks, her parents are doing just that. They're like, you know, follow the seashells home, you know. It's like, you know, giving her rhymes. It's like, remember this in order to, you know, don't, you know, don't get caught in the undertow type of things. So, like, these, these basic rules that they use to kind of help her and, you know, help her cope with this issue that she has. And why I found that to be so powerful, in a sense, is because what this movie did was they showed how parents handle when they have, like, special needs children, which is something you don't see particularly often in movies. You know, usually, the, you know, kids are, you know, they're just, you know, perfectly functioning kids. They don't always show kids with autism or with Asperger's or kids with other disabilities. They don't show these things very often. And actually in the original Finding Nemo, you had Nemo who was at a, yeah, at a disadvantage himself because one of his fins is was damaged, basically. So, you know, it to, to show that, to have them, you know, to show these scenes where her parents, who are played by um, Eugene Levy and Diane Keaton, to show the parents as they try to like help her work through you know that her short-term memory issues obviously they know they can't cure it so they have to work with it it's the same as you see with you know in reality with what parents of special needs children have to go through um, in order to you know help them become you know high functioning adults so it was actually I was really impressed by that that they they did that and they showed it in you know a very mature and a very um, sympathetic way which um, you know, is good, especially for kids with special needs who are going to watch this movie, and it, they might have this connection with that character because they can see that that, that character is going through the exact same stuff they are, um, which is kind of powerful in a way, which is something that you can expect from Pixar. I mean, Pixar gave us one of the best animated films of the last 10 years last year with Inside Out, which was in itself a challenging movie because it was it delved, delved into the psyche of a child going through significant change. And to show that was remarkable. Um, I even did a podcast about how remarkable that was because it was such a break from the norm for Disney or even for kids movies to show something that complex and that deep and to do it so well. That's why Inside Out was such a success is because they did it so well as well. Um, and here again, Pixar, you know, hits the nail on the head with a story where you have, um, you know, a basically a special needs child and the parents working with that child to, you know, help her, you know, help her grow and help her, you know, understand so that she can, you know, not just suffer this illness, she can actually live and, you know, live a happy life with it, which I thought was pretty good. Um, so I was impressed by that. I certainly was. Um, so now the negative. Um, unfortunately, this movie did not strike a significant chord with me other than kind of the surprise that they did with the, you know, like the special needs stuff. I thought that was a surprising touch, and I thought it was important to the story, but I felt like they failed in other regards. So the first thing is the fact that this movie was actually kind of unnecessary. Um, I don't like to say sequels are always unnecessary. I like to say, you know, if you have more story to tell, go right ahead and tell the story. I don't have a problem with sequels. I just have a problem with a sequel that doesn't necessarily stand on its own legs. And this one kind of didn't feel like it did because Finding Nemo, there's a reason people think it's such a great movie. And it is such a great movie. But there's a reason that it keeps coming up in conversation because it starts out with a severe tragedy. 
a child getting lost is obviously a severe tragedy. I'm not trying to downplay, you know, disappearing children as, a, as it's like, ah, oh, that's nothing. But, I mean, the Finding Nemo begins with murder and lots of it. And then, basically, this father has just this one child left. And so, obviously, you know, the trauma from this event, you know, Marlon has PTSD. He clearly has PTSD throughout that story. And so he obviously wants to do everything he can to protect his son. And then when his son is lost, it's, it forces him to find him. It, for, it, it actually is, it's not just a journey of, of, you know, desire. It's a journey of necessity because that's all he has left. And he's, you know, it, it's a growing journey. It's so much of that. This movie did not have that same thing because the journey was more like, I want to go find my parents, which is understandable that people would want to do that, but it doesn't carry the same weight as that journey of necessity where, you know, Marlon was, he had to find his son. He did not want his son to die. He did not want to lose another child because since he already lost so many at the beginning of Finding Nemo. Here, Dory wants to get back to her parents. She wants to find that, you know, find them again. She wants to have that feeling again. It just, it, it doesn't, carry that same dramatic weight that I felt like it did in Finding Nemo, um, which obviously throughout the movie is kind of in the back of my mind. It's like, well, it's it, this, this doesn't feel like, it, this feels more like, hey guys, let's go on a road trip, as opposed to someone kidnapped my child, I need to go after them and find them. It's, you know, the difference between like, you know, a road trip movie and a, you know, kidnapping movie. I mean, it's really, it's like, there's obviously very big differences between the two. Um, so, and, you know, they did throw in a lot of, like, Easter eggs from the first movie, or even just blatant, like, here's here's stuff from the original movie. Like, the end scene where, you know, the fish from the aquarium are, you know, in the bag still and puttering along. It's, it's cute. It's funny. It's a nice little throwback. But when they throw in the turtles again, it's like, now you're kind of straining to just, like, throw in these characters that you had before just to get them in there, just to, like, say, hey, remember these guys? Like, I'm really glad they didn't throw in, like, the sharks from the first movie, because that would have just been over the top of, like, okay, you're not trying to retread the, the first movie, you're trying to introduce a new story on its own, and in this one, I'm not sure that it did too well, because the other problem I had with it was the fact that her memory, her memory was kind of, like, convenient at times. It's like, there were times where it's just like somebody says something and it's like, oh, now I suddenly remember everything. As opposed to other times where she's just like walking around and she's just swimming around and then, oh, hey, I completely forgot what I was doing five seconds ago. So there, it, it was almost like the memory thing got a little bit too convenient at times as both like a dramatic moment or as a comedy moment or you know, as a storytelling thing. You know, it's just like to keep the story going, it's like, okay, now we're going to give her some memory, it was some ability to get her memory back, essentially. Um, and then there is the, just, um, so my key gripe for this movie is specifically the climax of the movie where, you know, they, after, you know, Dory reunites with her parents and they've realized they got to go get the truck, then it becomes this just like ridiculous moment. And I don't care about the ridiculous part of it so much. I mean, an octopus driving a truck is pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, I'd say that counts as ridiculous, um, but no more so than, you know, like the um, porcupines from over the hedge driving a truck or, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, when you're talking about a movie like this, you kind of have to strain ridiculous. You didn't get nearly any of that in the first movie, like of to this degree, like an octopus driving a truck. Didn't really get any of that in the first movie, which I think is what elevated it even more. But, I mean, still, with some of the other stuff that the fish did in the first movie, st obviously strains reality, and same thing here. They really do that with, you know, like, a lot of the stuff with the octopus, for that matter. I mean, you know, like, right, you know, basically driving around a little, like, um, um, like a baby cart, um, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of, like, very iffy moments, but but the reason I really disliked that choice, the choice that they made with the whole truck and the escape and that whole climax was because it actually just, when, they, when that happened, it actually confirmed my fear 
that I felt throughout the entire movie, which is just, this movie is Toy Story 2. This movie is basically a rehash of Toy Story 2 with fish. And I'm not going to say that that's, you know, a bad choice, because Toy Story 2 is obviously a fantastic movie, but to, to, base it, to do it again tells me that when it comes to sequels, Pixar does not have a strong standing when it comes to sequels with the exception, obviously, of the Toy Story movies, because Toy Story 2 was vastly different than Toy Story 1, and a fantastic movie. And then you have Toy Story 3, which was just mind-blowingly good. But then you have Cars, which in itself is not a great movie, but then you throw in Cars 2, which was just silly and stupid. This one, they obviously did not want to go the Cars 2 route, because Cars 2 was such a disaster, so they're like, okay, let's do what we know worked, Toy Story 2. And that scene really just kind of highlighted that this is basically the same movie as Toy Story 2, because in Toy Story 2, you know, they're basically, you know, driving around, chasing down airplanes and stuff like that. The only difference is, is this movie does not have a central antagonist, you know, which the first movie didn't really have an antagonist either, but, you know, you don't need one. But there needs to be obviously some kind of, I, I, I don't know, it just did not feel like it was a unique movie because even early on in the movie it almost felt like this just feels like Toy Story 2 all over again um, and that la that scene with the truck and the, the octopus driving it and you know despite the very humorous result of all that it was just it, it just fell flat and I did not think it was a good choice you know Part of that is maybe because this kind of was an unnecessary sequel. They did not need to go beyond Finding Nemo. I thought Finding Nemo had a great ending. It had a good, solid, closed ending. It didn't leave itself open for a sequel. Not to say that they couldn't make one, but it certainly wasn't like, you know, like there needs to be more of this story. It is one that I felt could have stayed contained. Whereas here, it really is just like, oh, hey, you guys had an adventure. Now it's my turn to have an adventure. And I just, it just didn't feel, it never felt as poignant or powerful as Finding Nemo did. And that's probably just because of the, again, the difference between a story, uh, a journey of necessity versus a journey of desire, which is kind of what it comes down to. She didn't need to find her parents because here, here's what kind of bugs me about the whole thing is when she does find her parents and has that, rev, you know, revelation of like, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm glad I, I was able to find you on my own, this powerful kind of moment. She also thinks, now I gotta go save my other family. So what that tells me is that ultimately her finding her parents was just this giant kind of like, you know, the whole point of it was to realize, oh, I have a family right here. But there was no, there was never a real issue with it there. If anybody, if the only person who like grew in this movie besides Hank the Septopus, because, you know, he went from being, you know, a guy determined to go to Cleveland to a guy who is going to help out a little bit. But the only character who really had any kind of change was Marlin, and which is kind of weird because Marlin is not necessarily the central character of this story. He is, but he has this, you know, revelation of like, well, you know, the way I have been operating is has obviously worked for me in the past, but it's not working forever. So maybe I need to change the way I approach things. Maybe I need to think of things differently. So he says, what would Dory do? So we have our, you know, what would Dory do bracelets going on? And, you know, he, he has this sort of change, whereas Dory doesn't really change or grow in the story. She's able to figure things out. She finds her parents, but as a character, she is pretty much the same. There's a scene at the end of the movie where the two of them are kind of sitting on this, you know, sitting on an overlook and just kind of have this moment, you know, Dory seems at peace, but I don't see that necessarily as building her character. I just think it's like, okay, her character gets a little bit of closure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she as a character has grown or changed versus Marlin, who actually did grow and change a bit. Um, and it, it again kind of reinforces, it's like, I didn't think that this needed to be I didn't think we needed this story. Um, but that aside, you know, since whether we wanted it or not, we got it. And for the most part, it is a good movie. It is entertaining. It's beautifully shot. 
and it has a lot of those, you know, kind of checkbox standard Pixar things in it. Um, doesn't have murder, which, you know, you could probably do without in a lot of these Pixar movies. <laughs> but, um, either way, um, so I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. So, um, in terms of, like, where it stands on the Pixar list, it's kind of in the middle. Um, I mean, the problem with Pixar is that you know, to pick a top five is almost impossible because when you have movies like Wally -E or The Incredibles or Inside Out, Toy Story, I mean, just <laughs> right there, Up, there's so many amazing movies that Pixar has come out with that to be able to like to put to fit this in there, it's like wow, where where do you put this on that list? It's pretty much middle of the ground or, you know, middle of the pack, if, if not kind of on the lower end, you know, down there with like Monsters University or um, Brave. So it's, it just isn't, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel the emotional impact of this movie that I thought that they could have had. And maybe that's just because it, as a story, it just wasn't the, the, the story that we necessarily were asking for. So, um, but if you disagree, please let me know. Or if you agree, also let me know. I don't care. I just like looking at comments. So that's my review of Finding Dory. Let me know in the comment section if you have any comments of your own. Um, tell me what you thought. But that is my review of Finding Dory, and I will see you next time on Key Gripe. So, bye.